time with us.
power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I am. Father, we love you today, that we come before you and we, we, we see literal miracles in our life. God, like our friend Marvelous, God, we know that you are our work, so be at work in us and in our hearts today. We love you so much. It's your heavenly name we pray. Everybody said. And there was no one in line at 2.45. As a matter of fact, they had to kind of reopen the door and people were yelling, come on, come on. And we were running with three kids and all of our luggage. We barely made it. 
Missing the bus to school is bad news because I got in trouble. Missing the bus to New Jersey was bad news because I had to wait an hour and a half. Missing the boat on your only cruise as a family is thousands of dollars out the window. But what if you were to try to catch the last bus out of town at Armageddon? What if you were trying to catch Noah's Ark? That's the boat you don't want to miss. In Genesis, we have been looking at the book of beginnings, a book of foundations. And we left off last week in Genesis chapter 5. This week we come to Genesis chapter 6. And it's the story of Noah's Ark. And this certainly is the boat you don't want to miss. In those days, if you missed the boat, it was real bad news. It wasn't in trouble with your parents. It wasn't being an hour and a half late. It wasn't thousands of dollars on a cruise. You were a goner if you missed this bus, this boat. And so we want to learn something because although we don't have to worry about a worldwide flood, God promised he's not going to do that again, right? Every time we see a rainbow, we're reminded he's not going to do that again. But judgment is coming. Oh, we believe that. And so there's a lesson for us here. Something worse than a flood is coming. Join me in Genesis chapter 6. Let's start in verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every intent, his heart was only set on evil continuously. Notice what is in man's heart. Evil, wickedness, rebellion. Notice what is in God's heart. Grief and sorrow. God is holy. God is loving. Humans are fallen sinful and rebellious, and God's heart is broken. Let's continue. Notice, I want you to look at the verbs. Every time God is mentioned, look at what he does in these verses, 5, 6, and 7. The Lord saw. The Lord, verse 6, was sorry. The Lord, verse 7, said. The Lord saw. The Lord cared. The Lord said. The Lord did something. You notice The Lord knows, the Lord cares, and the Lord does something. When you are convinced that God doesn't know, that God doesn't care, that God is not active in your life, remember, God knows, God sees, God cares, and God does something. So remember Noah's Ark when you feel like everything is gone wrong. Does God care? Yes. He always knows, He always cares, and He always does something. So what is He going to do? He said, verse 7, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. It's going to destroy man because God is righteous and God is just and he has to be just and punish evil. But, the big word at the beginning of verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In Genesis thus far, we've looked at where we came from and why we are like we are. God gave us choice, and with choice, we chose sin, and with sin comes consequences. It's the fallenness of the universe, the fallenness of man. But we're going to spend the rest of the Bible learning what God does to redeem man, and here we see that in the story of Noah. Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. So here is his story in verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. Perfect in his generations, not sinless, but mature and complete. Noah walked with God. Does that sound familiar? If you were here last week, you know that Noah is only the second and the only other person in the Bible that we are told walk with God like Enoch. He walked with God. Last week we talked about what walking with God would mean. And it connotes more than just living with God. Walking means motion. It means direction, motion and toward God. And it means discipline, step after step after step. He walked with God day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. He moved and he moved towards God. He loved him. He begot, verse 10, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
But as a reminder, the problem in the story, the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Verse 12, God looked upon the earth, and he in, indeed it was corrupt. I mentioned that before, right? For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So, does God just wipe everyone out? No. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God tells Noah what he's going to do. God is a creating God. He made us in his image. But he's a communicating God. He's a God who reveals himself. What good would it be if there was a God who loved us if he never revealed himself to us, if we could not know him? So he communicates to us, and that's what revelation is. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is God's instructions for life. Jesus tells us what he's done. He tells us what he's doing. He tells us what he's going to do. And in his word, he tells us what to do. And so that's why we read our Bibles, that's why we study them, that's why we obey them, because it's God's Word to us. God reveals what He's done, what He's doing, and what He's going to do. Let's look first of all at why you don't want to miss this boat. It's not a flood that's coming, but for us, you don't want to miss God's boat because judgment is coming. I want to look at a verse in the New Testament where Peter tells us a little bit more about this story of Noah and the ark. It's a historical story that Jesus believed, that Peter believed, and you can believe. And Peter tells us in 2 Peter 2, verse 5, If God did not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, then, verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. That's what we have to be concerned about in the future. Peter tells us, if God didn't spare the ancient world, neither will he spare the modern world. He won't judge us with a flood, but he will judge us with a fire and with the second coming in Armageddon. But notice what also he adds here. Something that we never learn in Genesis. The Old Testament tells us that Noah walked with God and he was a builder of a boat. But it never mentions that he was a preacher. And here in Peter, he tells us he was one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. Do you know what that means? While Noah was building a boat for a hundred years, he was also preaching for a hundred years. Now he didn't have any converts, did he? But he was a preacher of righteousness. While he was building, he was watching his neighbors and thinking, what's going to happen to them? And he was telling them, repent. God's not happy with the way you're living. You better start building a boat. And no one listened. No one built a boat and no one repented. But here is the truth. God is righteous and God will judge sin. So there's an important lesson for us to learn in the story of the ark. And that is there is always a price to pay for sin. There is a righteous God in heaven, and sin is punished. It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. God doesn't give us something we don't deserve. Wages is something you've worked for and earned. And when we sin, we deserve death. God gives us what we deserve, and there is always a price to pay for sin. I'm going to tell you a story this morning that I tell not with eagerness, not with pride, but with shame. I have to tell you this morning about the only time in my life when I ran from the police. It wasn't this week. It wasn't when I was a pastor at First Baptist of Troy. It was actually when I was 10 or 11 years old. And my brother, two years younger than me, Greg, was about nine, and he had his friend over, Billy, who was also nine, and we were staying up late at night, joking and fooling around, and nothing good happens after midnight, especially with 9 and 10 and 11-year-old boys. And one of us decided, let's go outside and cause some mischief. So we snuck outside after midnight, and again, I tell you to my shame that we went into other people's gardens and we stole their vegetables. I remember eggplants, peppers, and tomatoes. And then what are we going to do with those? We used them as projectiles. We were good kids. We didn't break windows. We threw them against garage doors. 
made a great big bang. It was hilarious. People would come running out, scared to death, and we would see them in their slippers and their robes and their pajamas yelling at us, and we would run and laugh. Brilliant as we were, we never realized that they might just not go back to bed. They might call the police. So after about 15 minutes of mayhem, here came some flashing lights over the horizon. And kids do not run from the police, but we ran from the police. And between two homes, we ran towards the woods. But I was a clever lad, a couple years older than Greg and Billy, and I'd seen enough television programs and enough movies. You don't run from monsters. You don't run from the police, you dive in the hole or you hide from them, let them pass you. Well, it was dark at night, so I dove in the bushes and I watched Greg and Billy continue to run and I watched the police officers run by with their flashlights and eventually catch Greg and Billy. And then to my shock and surprise, my brother did me wrong and turned me in. He said, there was three of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. So he started calling out, Jeff, Jeff, come out. I didn't come out. I had a good hiding spot. And so I watched as Greg and Billy walked by me with handcuffs behind their back. And I waited while they got in the police car. And I waited a long time till the police car drove away. And when I thought the coast was clear, I came out and I furtively ran home because I wanted to get in bed before the phone rang. As soon as I got in bed, the phone rang. I heard my dad answer the phone. I heard him clamber down the steps, and he began to shout, Jeff, are you here? And I said meekly, as if I was just waking up, I guess, yes, Dad. He said, did you go out with Greg and Billy? I said, yes, sir, but I chose to come home. <laughs> that was the truth, but it wasn't the whole truth. So he got in the car and he drove down to the police station. I tried to go back to sleep, didn't work. When my dad got home with Greg and Billy, he was really angry. He said, Jeff, you told me that you chose to come home. He was angry at me than he was at Greg and Billy. And he said, why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't answer, but obviously, because... And then he said, if you would have told me that you waited till after the police to come home, I would have taken you to the police station too. Duh, that's why I didn't tell you. <laughs> so there was a price to pay. It's not my main point, but there was a price to pay. Right then it was painful. But even worse, the next morning, there were three buckets and three sponges, and the three of us were marched up and down the streets of our hometown we had to knock on every door where we had stolen vegetables and apologize, and then we had to wash every single garage door up and down the street, and it was so embarrassing. There was soap and bubbles everywhere, and we were blushing, and people were laughing and angry. But here is what I want you to know. When I was in the bushes and I thought I got away with it, when I was in bed before the phone rang and I thought I got away with it, I didn't. And if you think the police haven't caught me, Yet. The IRS hasn't caught me. Yet. My boss hasn't caught me. My mate hasn't caught me. Yet. Here's the point of the story. There is always a father at home who knows exactly what you've done. You may never get caught on this side of heaven, but there is a heavenly father who doesn't have to find out. There is a heavenly father who knows. And part of this story tells us there is a price to pay for sin. That's the bad news, judgment. But here's the good news. God also makes a way. What does he tell Noah? There's a flood, get ready. How long can you tread water? No. He says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, verse 14. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. God gives him plans. Noah's never built a canoe before, let alone an ark. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window. You've got to have some ventilation, especially if you have animals in there. And you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. He gives them explicit directions. 
He tells them how to build a boat that will float. He tells them how to build a boat that will big en- be big enough to handle his family and all the animals he needs to take. God tells us exactly what to do and how to do it. So if you want to know how to avoid judgment in our future, he tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He doesn't just say be saved. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now today, modern skeptics dismiss this story as non-historical, non-scientific and ridiculous. There's no way you could fit all the animals on this ark. It's an ancient myth. But I want you to look at the amazing dimensions of this ark. What is a cubit? A cubit is about 18 inches. It's an ancient measure used from the tip of a man's elbow to the longest finger, about a foot and a half, half of a yard. And if you multiply it out, this would be a 450 foot long boat, one and a half football fields, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. That's pretty big. How big would that be? Well, that would be about half the size of the Titanic. It would be twice the size of a 747. This would be a huge ship, the largest up to that point, I'm sure. It would be the size of a modern football stadium. It would be able to carry 1.4 million cubic feet. It would be the same space roughly as 522 railroad cars. You want to bring a circus to town? I guess the animal rights people closed all the circuses, but you remember when the circus brought animals to town? 522 railroad cars. How many animals could you do with that? Actually, 125,000 average animals would fit on that ship. 125,000 animals, that's quite a lot. So it looks to be big enough. It would be, it's the right dimensions to float, big enough to cover all the animals. I want you to also notice something about the construction, not just the size, but it's made of gopher wood and it's going to be covered with pitch. I don't want to give you a Hebrew lesson this morning. You know a couple of Hebrew words like hallelujah, praise the Lord, and amen, so be it. If you know any other Hebrew words, maybe you might know the word for pitch. It's the Hebrew word kippur. If you've heard of Yom Kippur, a Jewish holiday, Yom is day, Kippur is covering, the day of the covering. So pitch was a covering, kind of like tar, pine sap. But covering come to, come to meant the covering for the altar, and it would be blood. And so Yom Kippur is the day of covering or the day of blood. And what the ark represents to us beautifully is our salvation. Our salvation doesn't come from a cross. It doesn't come from two sticks of wood. It comes from what covered that cross, the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not the cross that saves us. It's the one who died on the cross. It's his blood that saves us. And so the ark is a beautiful picture to us of our salvation. There is salvation nowhere else on the earth. The highest mountain was covered. The only salvation on the earth was in the ark with the covering. And the only salvation on earth, we're told in the Bible, there's no other way. He's the only way is through Jesus. No salvation anywhere. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus tells us. So he makes the ark. And then in verse 18, he says, I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons your wife and your son's wives with you. That's the eight that go on. Notice the words, go into the ark. Make note of that. We'll come back to that shortly. Verse 19, and of every living thing, this is the first time he mentions the animals, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark. I'm going to be so busy building a boat. How am I supposed to collect all the animals? Don't worry, they'll come to you, verse 20 tells us. Bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. So how many animals would that be? Today, there are 18,000 species on the earth. To save all the animals, you don't have to bring every breed of dog. You bring one dog and you can get all the different breeds from that one. There are 18,000 species. If you need to bring male and female, do the math. 36,000. I don't have room for that in my backyard. How about you? But Noah had room for that in his ark, right? He could carry, remember, 125,000? 36,000? 
Now let's be generous and say, what about any animals that have gone extinct in the last several thousand years? What if 50% of all the animals alive, maybe the dinosaurs that Noah took on the ark, have gone extinct? If there were twice as many species in those days, instead of 36,000, there would be 72,000 animals. Still plenty of room if you can carry 125. There is plenty of room on the ark, and the lesson for us is obvious. Come to Calvary. There's room at the cross for you. There's always room for more. And then we notice... He says in verse 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded, so he did. Here's the key. He believed God, but he believed God enough to do something about it. What would it be like if Noah said, yeah, sure, I believe you, God. And then he sat around and watched TV and waited for the rain to start. He would have drowned too, right? And that would be all history. He believed God and he did something. He went out and he built the boat. If you have faith in God, that doesn't just mean you believe something. It means you believe something enough to do something about it. And we read about that again in the New Testament. How can you not miss this boat? Well, you can't build a boat to miss the day of judgment, but you can have faith like Noah did. Hebrews 11:7. This is the hall of faith. We saw it last week when we read about Enoch, the second person in the hall of faith. Noah's the third. By faith, notice the first two words, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. It wasn't even raining or cloudy yet when God told Noah what to do. Moved with godly fear, he prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and he became heir of the righteousness which is according to, the last word, faith. First two words, by faith. Last word, faith. His works did not save him. Building the ark did not save him. Believing God saved him. And it's not your works that will save you. It's not of works thus anyone should boast. It is believing God and what Christ did for us on the cross. But here is the key, or number two, there is always someone to trust to save your soul. You can always trust in God. You can't hold your breath long enough. You can't build a boat that's safe enough, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It is believing in God. It's not just faith, it's who you believe in, and believing enough to do something about it. Over 100 years ago, there was a famous tightrope walker who wanted to gain a name for himself, so he stretched a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And you can bet a crowd gathered pretty quickly. After he'd gone across a couple of times, he came to one of the shores, the American shore, and said, how many of you believe I can cross again and carry a chair. And they all raised their hands, and he got a chair, and he walked across, and he came back to the crowd, now bigger, said, how many of you believe I can carry a person on my back across the falls? And they all raised their hands, and he said, who's volunteer? And all the hands went down real quick, and one hand stayed up. It was his manager who knew he could do it. And so he got on his back, and he went to the other side. So my question is, how many believed he could cross with a man on his back? All of them. How many got across to the other side? Only one. Only the one who really believed and trusted in him. I know there are people all around us, maybe some people here today, who say, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was God's son. I believe he died on the cross for us, and I believe he can save me. That's not enough. It's not of works, and it's not just an easy believism, I believe in Jesus. No, it's much more than that. It's the one who gets on Jesus' back and says, I can't save myself. If I'm going to get to heaven, the only way I'm going to get there is by you. And so if you believe, like Noah, you've got to do something about it. The ark was the boat you don't want to miss, but the cross is the way to heaven that you don't want to miss. I talked to you earlier about a, a cruise ship that we almost missed you ever seen one of these great big boats, twice the size of Noah's Ark? You know what they're made of? Metal. Metal doesn't float, right? Take some metal, put it in your bathtub, it goes right to the bottom. You want to get on one of those things and trust your life with it? But even though you can't be sure that thing is going to get you where you're going, you can't be 99% sure and get non-99% and keep one foot on shore, 
you got to either get on or get off. The same thing is true with an airplane. What are they made of? Metal. Metal doesn't rise in the air, it drops. But even though you can't be sure that plane will get you where you want to go, you can't be 99% on the plane and 1% still on the runway. You have to get on. You have to trust. You have to believe. And that's what salvation is about. It's about believing in Him. It's about not believing in Him and my works. It's about believing in Jesus 100%. So are you willing to get on and say, Lord, you take me? If you try and help, imagine being on the back of that tightrope walker and trying to help him balance. No, no, don't try and help him balance. You just hold on. Because if you try to help, you're going to both go over. If you try to help steer the airplane, you'll just mess things up, right? No, no, no. Get in the back seat. Let Jesus drive. Let him handle it. Trust in him. And that's what trust is. Remember this picture of the tightrope walker. Chapter 7, Genesis chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, okay, you've been building for 100 years. Come into the ark. Remember, I said, go into the ark. Come and go are related verbs. Sometimes it's almost the same verb. They both are verbs of moving. So to come means to move from there to here. And to go means to move from here to there. Go means come from a place that is close to a place that is far. Come means go from a place, move from a place that is far to one that is near. So the concept was when they were outside, he says, I want you to go into the ark when the time is right, when it's finished. But now he says, come into the ark. So here's my question. Where's God? He's inside the ark. That's what God says to Noah. That's what God says to you. I want you to come unto me, Jesus says, all you that are weary and heavy laden, come to me. Yes, he will send you out. He will say, go into all the world. But first he says, come to me. Come where I am. Come towards me. Trust in me. Yes, I will send you out to others, but it's come to me. You and all your household. This is pretty important. In Acts 16, 31, when the Philippian jailer asked, what do I have to do to be saved? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. In the same word, and your household. Does that mean if you get saved, your whole house gets a free pass? No, but that means if you get saved... You want other people to get saved. So Noah says, come on in the ark. So when you come in, don't get on and say, boy, glad I'm safe. Hope you all have a good time out there. No, when you get safe inside the ark, when you're covered by the pitch, the blood of Jesus, you want others to as well. And so you want to encourage everyone you know, everyone you love to get on board as well. And so like Noah, you ought to automatically become a preacher of righteousness. Repent, trust in Jesus. He's the only way. He says, Noah, you come in, but then, more importantly, tell your family to get in. So, verse 15, they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, all the animals, all the flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Notice who shuts the door. I don't know if Noah even thought if he had a mechanism to shut the door. Maybe there's no handle on the inside for good reason. But God shuts the door. And you know what's significant? God told Noah to build the ark when the sun was still shining. And the sun is still shining when he shuts the door. The rain hasn't started yet. So now he must feel pretty silly locked up in that ark. And the sun is still out. And people might be laughing. But God shuts the door. Noah has preached his last sermon. And he's given his last fruitless altar call. And no one else has come but his daughters and sons-in-law and his wife. But now the door is shut. And the lesson for us is obvious. One day, the door will shut. And we usually don't know when that will be. Oh, you might be one of those lucky people who have the doctor tell you you have six months to live. Lucky? Blessed? No. Usually we don't get that, do we? Don't come... Life doesn't come with an expiration date. There is no warning. So we don't know when history will end or when our life will end. We need to come now. The story continues, verse 17. The flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth, high above the mountains, no safe place on earth except for the ark. 
And interesting, the waters lifted up the ark, drowned it everybody else, but it lifted Noah and the ark up. Verse 20, the mountains were covered. Verse 21, all flesh died that moved on the earth. Not just the animals, every man. Imagine the death toll on this day. In 2009, Japan suffered a historic earthquake that moved the entire nation. And there were 25,000 people who were killed. Before that, in 2004, in Southeast Asia, there was a bigger earthquake and a tsunami that killed 250,000 in one day. But imagine 10 times that dying, perhaps more than that, when the entire human race, except for eight, was wiped out. I want you to think about it for a moment as Noah, his wife, and his three daughters and three sons-in-law are sailing on top of this crest of a flood, and all of those people have died. The Bible doesn't tell us, but I imagine that some of Noah's neighbors took a tour of that boat. I mean, it would be hard to miss, right? If someone had a football-sized boat in their front yard next door, you'd probably say, hey, what you building here? And he probably showed a few people. Maybe in his sermon he said, hey, you need to build one of these. I can give you the blueprints. I'm sure hundreds of people had been on that boat who were not there now. Maybe, now the Bible doesn't tell us again, the Bible doesn't tell us that Noah and his three sons-in-law built the ark themselves. They had 100 years, but maybe he hired some people. He didn't have any expertise. He was an old man. Maybe he hired a lot of workers. Maybe there were people who built that ark who weren't even on it. I want you to think about this building. This building doesn't save us, but it represents God's salvation to us. There, were, there have been hundreds of people who have passed in and out of these doors through the years and not every one of them are in God's church. There have been people who have made deliveries here, people who have delivered something here or, or visited here. There are even perhaps hundreds of people who built this church. Electricians and bricklayers who built this church but are neither in this building nor in any church today. Is it possible that people who helped build this church are not a part of God's church? Is it possible that there's someone here this morning inside this building but not inside the ark covered by the blood of Jesus? Oh, it's very possible. It happened in those days, and I'm sure it happens today. So here is the urgency. When you don't want to miss this boat, and it's now. Again, a New Testament verse. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, 38, and 39. As the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. God shut the door. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. I remember when I was younger, I imagined these verses gave the characterization of the days of Noah as being tremendously evil. And everyone said, yeah, it's just like the days of Noah, right? People eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Think about it for a minute. I eat and drink just about every day. How about you? Anything wrong with that? No. Anything wrong with getting married? No. More people ought to get married and not live like they're married when they're not. There's nothing wrong here. What Jesus is saying is not that they were particularly evil, which they were. He's saying it was just a normal day. They're all sitting, going about their business. Noah's holed up in that ark, crazy guy, but all of a sudden, they did not know until the flood came. And that's the way judgment comes sometimes to us. The world may not end tomorrow, but someone's life may end today. The door is open now, but we have to know the door will not always be open. And so now is always the best time to choose. There's always a price to pay for sin, and there's always someone to trust in. But there is no time like the present to choose. Now is always the time to choose. In Joshua 24, 15, Joshua says, Choose you this day who you will serve. My favorite verse in the Bible, Psalm 118, verse 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. Don't wait till tomorrow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul says, Now is the accepted time. 
There's no time like the present. There's only two times. We say there's past, there's present, there's future, there's one o'clock, two o'clock. No, there's only two times. There's now and there's too late. Tomorrow may still be now, but for some of us, it may be too late. There is always now. It's never too late until it's too late, but you never know until it's too late. Many of you have been praying for my family this past couple of weeks as we buried my father-in-law. Lynn's father passed away two weeks ago, and we did not know where he was because for 87 years he rejected Jesus Christ. And so when I announced his death on Sunday morning, I said, please pray for my wife, her father. And I started to say, went. I'm used to saying went to be with the Lord. It's a nice euphemism for died. I stopped myself because we didn't believe he had. When we left to go up there and I was going to deliver the eulogy, I was praying, what do I say? What do I say? When we got there, we were overjoyed to know that he prayed with his wife before he died. And that gives us hope because the thief on the cross prayed a last minute prayer. And it's never too late as long as you have breath. But I'm here today to tell you, do not do what the thief on the cross did and do not do what my father-in-law did. Do not miss out on a life of joy in following Jesus and do not play, do not gamble with your life because you never know if you will get that last minute opportunity. Let me tell you one last story. My best friend in Baltimore, my, my assistant pastor, had a burden for his next door neighbor for years to tell him about Jesus. He thought, I'll tell him about it this Thanksgiving. I'll tell him about it this Christmas until they saw the ambulance pull up to his next door neighbor's home and cart him away. And it was too late. He never got a chance to tell him about Jesus. To this day, he doesn't know where he is, and he fears the worst. Is there someone today that needs to get on the ark today? Is there someone that you know, you're already on the ark, but you need to ask someone else to join you? Do not wait. Now is the accepted time, and tomorrow may be too late. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to repent. Lord, thank you for the ark that is Jesus and his blood. And we thank you for offering to us salvation. I pray that today that everyone in this building knows Jesus as Savior, but I'm sure that there's probably at least one or two who do not know for sure or are sure that they are not believers in Christ. And I pray that today they might accept your gracious gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus. And they might pray something like this in their heart to you and mean it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know I deserve death and hell for my sin against you. But I believe you loved me. And you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I believe in you, but I don't just believe. I want to get on your back, and I want to go to heaven on the basis of what you've done for me. Save me for Jesus' sake. If your head's still bad. If you prayed that prayer this morning with me, I'd love to pray with you, pray for you. We pray with you here at this altar. If you shake my hand at the door, say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I didn't, and I need to. I'd love to pray that prayer with you. If you're a Christian and there's somebody that you know that needs Jesus, would you tell them today before it's too late? Would you pray for them? And then would you find a way to communicate the good news that Jesus died for them and his blood can cleanse them and give them a place in heaven?